Good morning. Tim's looking good. Yeah. Good. Good. Uh, broken nose, remember? Come up through the day. Did, did, did they, was it set? Stapes, good. Double gold medalist sneaking past me. Well done. Good baby Graves. Five minutes. How many times did he tell you? How many times did I tell you? Who am I going to believe? An amateur or my world champion? Oh, three times. <laughs> Here we go. Twice. Ten. 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 Need to be honest, bro. Need to face up. It's called, it's called taking responsibility for your own actions. That's why it's called protein. 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 You'll need some protein after I finish with you today. You get some grease on hand, though, yeah? Yeah. And stay away from David Johnson. Right, let's go, get that loose jog on. Make me feel like a school teacher. Are you gonna fight with chewing gum in? I need skips, let's go. Four now, pick them up. Full extension, right through the calf. Keep the breathing regular. Nice Dave Graham. Keep going, down and back, pick them up. What's your earliest memory? I don't have too much of a memory in the fight game. Uh, earliest memory. In my earliest vivid memory, uh, one that I still think about to this day, uh, was my first fight as a kid. It was in uh, a ginnel, an entranceway. Uh, on Brody Street in, in Stretford. It's actually knocked down now. The street where we used to live, it's knocked down. But when the kids used to fight, we used to fight in a in a ginnel in this like passageway between two blocks of houses. Uh, and I was having a scrap with one of the lockets. Uh, and I remember kind of banging his head on the wall and his head splitting and kind of wanting to stop, thinking that was uh, kind of bad and you know shouldn't be doing this, and stopped. But what I do remember about it is my granddad, a few hours later, when I kind of gone in, because he was in the backyard a few doors away and he was listening to this altercation and this fight, and uh, you know, he kind of commended me, but remember him like morally saying, you know, it's kind of good what you did and stopped. You didn't give up, but you stopped at the right point, and yeah, and I, yeah, I, I, it's a memory I think about quite often. So I feel just supremely confident knowing that he's there. He's definitely got that loud, distinctive voice. With no, you can't not hear it. You probably hear it outside the arena. I'd never met someone with kind of as much passion for what they were doing and the best at what he does. How can you describe him like an Albert Einstein? You know what I mean? He's not, he's not a straight up guy. He's a genius, isn't he? I've known Carl for a long time. You know, Carl has been one of the leaders of mixed martial arts in, in the in the UK for a long, long time. I, I remember before I turned professional, I was I was fighting on his submission league tournaments and getting strangled and leg locked and all kinds of things by his guys. He's always he's always developed such a high level of of, of fighter, um, particularly grapplers. You know, excellent top game, very strong, very uh, very well disciplined in their in their approach. And, you know, Carl's. You know, he's contributed so much to the sport of mixed martial arts in Europe, and and he's one of those kind of those those foundational pillars in the UK mixed martial arts scene that, that has always held it up. So we're all thankful to him for that. Carl's like Marmite. People either like him or they don't like him. I love Carl. Love him to bits. Uh, basically, I am probably the most senior uh, doctor in the UK when it comes to. Uh, working at MMA fights. Um, Carl is the original MMA guy. Back in the days of, oh, is it Combat Magazine? It's either Combat Magazine or the other one. Uh, but he, he is the original guy. He used to write articles back in the day when uh, his gym was originally called Defense, Defense Unlimited, and then he became SBG. But he is the original guy. Every, everyone in, well, more, more or less everyone in Manchester involved in MMA can somehow trace their lineage back to Carl Townsville at some point. Uh, that's the sort of uh, reputation he, he, he has. Left school kind of early. I didn't like school. I learned to read in school by reading uh, Bruce Lee's Fighting Method and uh, Combat and Fighters magazine. 
Now, I didn't really like school. Uh, now, I wish I could go back um, and know what, knowing what I know now. Uh, but uh, when I left school, I went full time into doing martial arts. Carl is really, really technical. Uh, his, his mind is like a computer uh, and he's constantly analyzing things. Uh, he's constantly looking at things and breaking them down into tiny, tiny little pieces, um, which uh, completely amazes me because I, I, I can't see these, these intricacies, but he can break them down uh, and tell you exactly what to do, when and where. Uh, as I said, he's, he, he's like a computer. And I remember him, he carries this file of facts. I don't know what's in there, but he carries the file of facts with him and he's, he's constantly making notes uh, in this file of facts. Um, so that, that, that's the sort of guy he is, very, very technical, very, very analytical. Uh, just a, a genius in the MMA, in the MMA game. Okay, it's going to warm down. I'm going to take your gloves off, take them off now. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, from this point forward, if I hear any more Velcro, You have to be the guy in them rounds that's who's trying to steal the next round. You want to be the one pushing in. You want to be the one trying to sneak your go on the wall. Yeah? Everyone needs a go, especially as fights are coming up. That's resilience, that's grit. You could watch Matt on Saturday. You know, we know he's tough. You're all tough, you're here. It's about resilience. It's about that going that point one of a second more than the other guy because he feels the same he wants to give up but to be on such a back foot can't see cut and then to do that you know in that environment and push that a bit more and keep going for that triangle that's resilience and you, you don't you don't oh yeah when i fight I'll, i'm different that's bullshit it's bullshit yeah it's a choice it's a it's a mindset doing that extra bit so that your, your, your round timer on sprint stops at 20 seconds but you're going to do 22 not 19, not 18. Yeah, you go balls to the wall for 20 seconds. Push it, do you know what I mean? Makes sense. You're gonna go in a sauna or whatever you're gonna do. And you're gonna go in there, I'm gonna do 20 minutes, but you're in there in about 17 minutes, you think, oh, I'll just cool down now. No, you're doing 20 minutes or you're doing 21. You're taking it that bit further. When you're doing your sprint and you're on a treadmill, yeah, you're taking it down, okay? And you don't start at, you know, you're doing a minute, at a minute, then you start to take it down. Not at 58 seconds, yeah? It's a habit, you develop it. That trying to get up again, again, again. You're not down until you're locked down with the cross face on and all four, two shoulders and your hips stuck on the floor. Till then, you're trying to get up. Because what's the guy doing then? Yeah, he's defending, he's not, he's not attacking you. Yeah, make sense? Okay, feet back, heels out. Good session, by the way. Lock this in, lock this in, and let's go into this. <laughs> now, when a former army medic saw a mum and child being threatened by a knifeman, he didn't hesitate to step in and save them. Kevin Taylor put all his military training and his martial arts skills to the very, very best use. Yeah, he just finished his shopping in Failsworth near Oldham when he saw this incident unfold in the supermarket car park. The attacker got the shock of his life when Kevin leapt over a car bonnet to grab him and snap that knife in two. Amy Welsh has the story. He's come around here and he's going in his pants and he's pulled out a knife. It's like a, bit, uh, a kitchen knife. When Kevin Taylor saw a man approaching a mother and her children with a knife, he knew he had the skills to save them. I thought, oh my God, he's going to stab the woman. And just thought, I'm going to have to stop him. It was around 3.30 on Monday afternoon that Kevin spotted a man with a knife in the Morrisons car park. He says what he did next was a split second reaction and that if it happened again, he'd do the same. So this is where I hit him, hit him on the right hand, grabbed it, the knife with his, in his hand and cupped it as hard as I could so he couldn't, couldn't, couldn't move. This image shows Kevin restraining the man while waiting for police to arrive, a restraint method he says he learnt while training in jiu-jitsu at this Manchester gym. Which obviously helps me control his, his upper body while we were stood up. We then, once I took him down, the knee right position on the hips and the head, it, it helps massively control him. It really, it's really an uncomfortable position. It also make, made him drop the, drop the blade. Yeah, there's a, there's a few stories over the years 
guy's been involved in situations and I don't know, bag snatcher or in a street fight. But yeah, obviously, you know, physically trained guys. And uh, but I think as opposed to the self-defense type thing, if we look at that in, a, in, in honestly, it's not about one guy being a super martial artist and beating six other guys up. If someone's trained and you know they're a good athlete and they know about strategy, it's going to be about avoidance, distance management. Don't be in the wrong places. You know, don't be hanging about in a bar at 3 a.m. with guys that carry knives. That's awareness, right? You know, distance management. It's, you know, you can't hit me from here. Make sure you control the distance, whether that means being miles away from some clown or, you know, the last thing is the actual hands-on hand combat type situation. And usually, you know, with our guys and all the situ situations I've known, they're skilled enough to, to restrain someone and deal with it that way, you know? These aren't trouble causes, they want to avoid it, you know, they're aware. Then they walk out of that gym day after day and someone wants to kick off with them or whatever, they're not interested. It's just like, it's like a joke. I spent some time, you know, trying to be the nice guy and well, people have different styles. Some guys are going to be nurturing, some guys are going to be authoritarian, laissez-faire, you know, you, you, if, if, you, you, need, if you, need, you need trust in people you're working with. So if you don't, if you're not being honest, you pretend to be something you're not, that will always shine through. That, the masks of illusion will always be peeled off and the true self will be revealed. You know, and I'm, I'm a narky. You know, I'll say it like, it's just my way or the highway, that's it. You know, and it's like, doesn't mean, not nasty, but it's kind of how I work. Some people need that. So those guys that are with me, they kind of need to be around that. Every individual relationship is, is separate. I cannot be what this coaching model, each individual relationship is an individual relationship. It's not, it's not like a, okay, high five, happy, clappy, positive, let's all think this and it works for everyone. It's not. It's an individual relationship that's based on trust. If someone's going into a cage to a fight or into a high level sporting competition, 
you know, you want someone that you trust, that you trust there and vice versa. I can't work with people that I, you know, I don't trust. The first time I met Carl, I didn't directly meet him, I heard him. Um, we were at, uh, I think it was the 10th Legion show, and I was sat with Eddie, who was one of my training partners, and you could, I can't remember who was fighting, but you could hear Carl's voice over everybody else. Uh, and Eddie, was, Eddie told me who he was, and a few weeks later, he was calling him Matt Inman at Strike and Submit, and I, watched, I just sat there and watched them warm up, and I went over, had a quick chat with him, said I'd, like, I'd love to come down and train, and he was like, cool bro, uh, send us a message. <laughs> And the next thing I know, I'd, I was I sent a message. I said, okay, I'm gonna come down then. Uh, I want to sort hotels and stuff so I could stop for a week. And he was like, oh, don't worry about it. Just, just get a train at the gym, just come down. <laughs> we, I got the train down, turned up at the gym. Next thing I know, Carl's like, I'll show you where my apartment is. He let us stay in his place. And this is a guy who I'd met for maybe five minutes and spoke to a few times over, like sent a message to. And he was letting me stay at this house, just so I could come and train. I started training in Thai boxing. Uh, I was a kid pretty much and just, just came through that. I spent uh, a, a fair bit of time training in Newcastle and then I got into MMA by that point and I decided uh, it coincided with me moving to Manchester about about 10 years ago now. Um, I knew Carl, but I didn't know him, but I knew of him already through a, a guy who had been training with up there who trained with, with him. So. Um, I, uh, when I came down and, and I wanted to make a go of, of MMA full time, it seemed like a logical choice. And that's how I ended up uh, training with, with Carl and SPG. The, the, the kind of combined wisdom I've received off Carl over the last, you know, going on 10 years now has, has been like, uh, you know, I think we're at a stage now where we don't really need to, to talk or he doesn't need to give me words of advice and stuff anymore. I, I know. I know what my own approach to fighting should be and, and you know that's all come through training with him. We just we just kinda gelled like that now where we have there's very little that needs to be said, I think, at this stage. I mean we've done this would be a 30th professional fight I've had under Carl. So um we're not new at this and that's not counting all the, the kind of boxing matches or tie boxing fights I had with him as my trainer as well. I've known about Ella for years. You know, we kind of came up same age, same area. She was at Toddy's and, you know, I'd re I read about her in magazines. I kind of knew her. I was actually in the States uh, working. I came back to the gym. Oh, some guys messaged me, some of the coaches, said there's uh, some Thai girl in the gym. She's really good and blah, blah, blah. So I kind of knew her, didn't know who she was. I went back in the gym and she was actually there sparring. You can look and see, she's good, you know? And I was kind of looking at her from, fight point view, <laughs> you know, and what she, I think what she remembers is uh, me just shouting at the person she was sparring with. First impressions of Carl weren't great, we always laugh about this because I didn't actually like Carl when I first met him, I thought he was loud and rude and I tried to avoid him when I was in the gym, which was kind of difficult because he was like teaching most of the classes, but once I got to know him, you know, it was, I found he was actually quite a nice guy and we had a lot in common and the same sense of humour. But I think to be honest, she got back and tried to kickbox into because um, that's where she was comfortable, and then feel out the jiu-jitsu. I think she came to realise that she'd need to be an all-round fighter to learn jiu-jitsu. I actually had my first like Brazilian jiu-jitsu lesson with Carl at the garage in our old house. But nowadays, I tend to do classes down at SPG Manchester with you know taught by Carl and the other coaches, and I got my brown belt like. Um, about a month ago now. I've had a lot of Thai boxers come, uh, high level Thai boxers, and they, they don't get a feel for it. Ella didn't at first, she's kind of a so opposite, you know, she's getting older someone, uh, but she stuck with it and she's actually, uh, you know, she just got a brown belt a few weeks ago. She's a, when you think someone who's just under 50 kilos, and I can have a good role with Ella. Both been involved in martial arts from quite an early age for like 30 years now. So it's just become part of our lives. You know, we love what we do. Um, but having said that, you know, we're not constantly talking about it or watching like fights and instructionals, but 
you know, we do kind of bounce ideas off each other and we, you know, we try and train together at least once a week. That could be like pad work or it could be like rolling together. You know, he does bounce ideas off me, like, you know, new techniques. He'll, you know, I'll be sat at home watching TV or something. He goes, come over here, let me try this. And he'll try a technique on me and I'll try and get out of it. If I can't, then he knows it, it probably works. <laughs> so, yeah. My coach, and he's still my coach to this day, uh, it's the only guy after Hoist Gracie that I've received belts off in Jiu Jitsu, is Matt Thornton. Uh, Matt's very articulate, very well educated in philosophy and reasoning. Um, and the way we were training at the time, kind of going towards you know, more effective training methods, that type of thing, that paradigm shift was happening around about the time, and Matt was doing the same thing in the States. In John Kavner in Ireland and we kind of all met up and Matt had a really good way of explaining it making it very simple the coaching methods down to you know the I method which is introduction isolation and integration so everything we do you introduce it with no resistance then you'll isolate it against a live resistant opponent and then you'll integrate it like bring it back into the game that's the process but the main principle was aliveness so everything we do needs time and energy and motion. This is a live, you know, live sport. It doesn't, you know, people don't work football or basketball or cricket in set patterns, because that's not how it works. Not in catters, it needs to be live. So aliveness is time and energy and motion. There needs to be movement. You know, in any athletic endeavor, there's gonna be movement in sport. Um, the energy, in this form, it would be resistance. The opponent giving you resistance, you know, and that's how you develop timing. SBG has been, you know, going up solidly for a long time. We have a lot of um, a lot of competitors in jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, mixed martial arts, obviously. The big thing at the moment, you know, we, we have a great team, which people have been winning consistently for years. Conor McGregor is, you know, everyone knows Conor, and the, the, the stuff he's done uh, for sports is, you know, the sport is absolutely massive. In MMA, I, I believe, he's, you know, like Ali in boxing, Conor's done it in MMA. I, it'll never happen again in our lifetime, the shift that he's, he's brought in by how he puts it over, his skill, you know, and that's what he's done. He's put, he's put it in the public eye and it's gaining acceptance for what it is. It's, you know, the ultimate athletic endeavor. It takes all the dexterity of a gymnast, the strength of a bodybuilder, et cetera, et cetera, while someone's trying to break your arm, choke you or punch you in the face, okay? It isn't, and it's not with no rules. Uh, you know, it's a well-organized sport and you know, he's brought money into that and he's put it in front of the public eye So yeah, that's a massive contribution. Everybody knows Connor and you know, it's, it's wonderful what he, you know, what he's done I just got back training and my manager contacted to say the UFC one offer us a fight uh, It was to fight in Germany against a guy called Martin Bushcamp so I done everything I could. I think Carl was on holiday with Ella and I was doing anything I can to get in contact with him. And I had to get forms filled in by him. And he was he was trying to find somewhere to fax them off or scan forms and print them out. I can remember that. And so we signed the contract for the fight. I came down to do my medicals. So he was offered a contract with the UFC. Uh, and as part of the um, process before his fight, you have to be licensed by uh, one of the athletic states in, in, in America, which involved uh, routine medical, blood tests, and a brain scan. So uh, Carl rang me up and said Alex needs his, his medical doing, so I sorted Alex out. 
Um, we did his medical, we did his scans, and pr- probably about five days later, we got Alex's uh, report back. And on the Saturday before the fight, I got a phone call to say there's something on my brain scan. Like, I got told the fight was off. The first person I rang was, was Carl. The first thing he said was, look, fighting's not everything. You're gonna be an incredible coach. You don't have to fight. So if it is something that's gonna stop you fighting, don't worry about it. Uh, and it wasn't good news because it showed that Alex had a, what we call a lesion. It was a, it was a slight abnormality uh, on his brain scan. And, and we, we weren't 100% certain as to what that um, blemish or abnormality on his scan was. So on the basis of that, uh, Alex needed further investigation. He needed to see a neurologist. Um, privately back at uh, home in the northeast uh, and on the basis of that um, Alex's fight was cancelled uh, which essentially put a, a, an end to his career at that time as, as a fighter. It, <laughs> the situation was compounded by the fact that we didn't know what was going on. You know, we didn't know if this was brain cancer, if this was life-threatening, if this was terminal. So. He was, he was absolutely in bits. Uh, and there's nothing that I could do uh, at that time to console him because I didn't know uh, what, what, what the issue was, uh, which is why he, he, he had to see a neurologist for further tests and further scans. Like the fighter in us just was like, <laughs> I just want to fight. You know, like I'd thought the UFC was my dream at that time. Uh, and that it was just taken away a week before the fight. It was, it was incredibly heartbreaking. It got worse from there. On the Tuesday, I got the radiologist's report and the differential was that it's possibly inflammation or a low-grade glioma. Uh, so it would be a tumor on my brainstem. Unfortunately, I spent a lot of time on Google <laughs> and I discovered that brainstem tumors don't have a recovery rate. And I dug myself into the world's worst hole. And during that time, like all the guys down here were were very supportive and Carl was massively supportive and, and helped when I was going through that because when you get information like that, you instantly think the worst. From there, I had to see a neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon was like, look, I don't know. It's in a part of your brain we can't biopsy or do any of the tests on. All we can do is watch and wait. So I had to wait six months between scans to see if there's any growth or development on the lesion. Fortunately, there wasn't. Uh, I got a, another scan in the January and it said that there was no change at all and I got referred to a neurologist. So when he did have his further scan and it came back that it was a scar? Yeah. Yeah. Um, how did all that come about? That I don't know. Uh, that you'd need to have a word of Alex. Um, I'm not 100% certain as to how, uh, how, he t- how he took that afterwards. I assume he was made up. Well, he was because he told me. Six feet two inches tall. He weighed in at 170 pounds. Fighting out of Manchester, England. Matt in
Freeman. Referee Mark Goddard about to get this one underway. Three five minute rounds if they need them in the Cage Warriors welterweight division. Unanimous decision, Matt Inman. Here is Ali. Touch gloves. Let's do this. Uh, I was in the gym, uh, ready to do some training, a little bit of sparring with some of the guys who had fights coming up. And Matt called me over, told me what happened, and I, like I was down to train with two of my students, and and then he told us. And um, you saw January twenty fifth was. Um, in the gym for a Thursday morning sparring session. Uh, looked at my phone just before I got started up and started with the lads and I had a message from Ella saying, um, give me a call when you finish with the session, which is obviously pretty unusual and I had kind of a bad feeling about things. So I called her back straight away just as the session started. And um, she told me that, that Carl had passed away and um, and then like it was a case of like all the lads obviously were there ready to train and that kind of thing so I kind of tell the lads and I just went from there on the, um, yeah on a Thursday morning just like that. If you look at what we've built at SBG, I've done it from guys that have trained, maybe started at 18 or 20. I've not had, I've not had anyone from a kid. Inman was 18 when he came to me. No, uh, he was yeah, 19. He's now 30, you know? So he's, I've never trained, I've never had anyone from a kid because it was in town, difficult, showers, it's a bit of a rough place. You know, you get all the inner city kids and they were nicking phones and which is, you know, fair enough. But I've never had that grassroots. That's what I want this for. And I've got two people managing the grassroots program. They bring them up to us to the protein. So I'm, I put a tier in. That's the next level. Right, well, let's recap what we spoke about on Saturday, man. Respect. The tap. The tap. Oh, well, respect to the tap's part of respect, but what is respect? Respect. We've got some really good answers on Saturday. <laughs> Eve, we'll do you first, then go on. Respect each other, the world will be a different place. Yeah. Go on. Respect each other, uh, even though they're different countries. Use all different colours. Use, use all different colours. Just, just respect anybody you see. Yes, yeah, so respect everyone. Treat everyone with respect. Yeah, but not people who are murderers. Don't respect them. Well, treat people with respect until they, they give you reason not to treat them with respect. My greatest achievement in martial arts. If I could narrow it down, it would be making martial arts and combat sports accessible to each and every individual. It's not just the high level athlete, the way we train, the way uh, it's put there, it, you know, it could be 
someone's granddad on the mat sparring with a, some kid from Salford who's a good athlete. You know, it's, it's for everybody. The method is available for everybody. So, and everybody can work together and learn something off each other. So making, uh, the greatest thing would be uh, the environment that we've created you know, as a, as, a, as a group, an environment where people can come in. And sometimes I forget, you know, it's Christmas has just gone. People like send me messages and say, you know, thanks so much, this has changed my life or influenced my life. So I'd say it's the, the community. The, a, a gym's not the four walls. Fight team's not the guys on the team. It's, it's the community, it's the connection, and it's the growth. And, you know, it's an individual sport, but everyone grows together, you know, via competition, competitor, to search together. Right now all the gyms are closed across the UK, that includes all the SPG gyms and I imagine all the other coaches like myself are raring to get back teaching classes, working with our athletes and get things moving again. But one thing I can guarantee during this period that all the SPG members felt a, a warmth of the community that we have and I'm really grateful for that but I, I can't wait to see you all again in person and get back training. Hey guys, I hope everyone's um, keeping well, staying active. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone back in the gym uh, when we can get back to it. Carl Tungo cares more about if I win a fight than, than I care if I win a fight and that's just, that's just how he is and he'll always be that way you can't, uh, you can't, you can't take that from him like when, when you win he's happier than me and when I lose he's, he's sadder than me and that's just Carl Tungo he just is a, he cares and this is, this is what makes him special. I've, sh I've given shout outs on Mother's Day before, <laughs> I've given shout outs, more like a mother figure definitely. <laughs> I don't know what dads are like around your end, but he's more like a mother figure. He tells you off, he keeps you in check, and that's how he is. Stop your steps, good. Left and right, moving up. Hey! Beautiful round. Good round, good setups. Wait, touch gloves. Beautiful. See you touching gloves after every round. It's not personal. Let's go.